All right. So let's take a look at the scriptures that guide the message for today. We began with Deuteronomy and talk about the law. Next up, there is this thing called armchair theology and praxis or practice. Or if we put it another way, a statement church and church lift. James is a practical theologian, a coach, if you will. And like Paul, he celebrates God's amazing grace, but counsels, don't just listen, act. Let your life speak. Let your values come alive in your local and global commitments. So from James 1, verses 17 through 27, these words. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, of persevere, being not hearers but forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. So these next words from Mark extend those of James, connecting the impact of our inner life and our outward behavior. Doctrine and ritual are valuable as the inspiration to loving action and shape our lives, but their proof is found in our love and care for one another. Here are these verses excerpted from Mark 7. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? but eat with defiled hands. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied, prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold the human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by, by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. The word of God for all people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So I'm guessing that all these cards, they're 
mashed up on top of what is our outdoor altar and on the ground may have caught your curiosity by now. And I've been here long enough that you know that I occasionally dress the altar to, to extend a story. So just a few more minutes and I'll let you know what that is. <laughs> Let's start here though with the scripture. After weeks with bread and manna and understanding Jesus is the bread of life, we go in, in the Gospel of John, we go back to Mark. And uh, the first lectionary scripture we get is this one that of all things has the Pharisees and Jesus arguing about whether or not they've washed their hands. Really? If you notice, if you've heard in the scripture, we also notice that Jesus doesn't chastise the Pharisees about the washing of hands. He's okay with that piece. His concern is wider than that. When I listened to the scripture this time around, what stuck out for me was where the focus was. I thought, gosh, here they are. And of all the things that the Pharisees know about Jesus and the disciples and whoever's present that day, they chose to pick out this one thing. Not all the other things that have been done, but just this one thing. Do we need to adjust this, Tim? I got this speaker too loud. <laughs> and I think that's at the heart of what's being talked about here. This one thing is overriding your ability to perceive all of the things that are happening around you in this moment. Now, the Pharisees were legitimate in asking why they weren't observing this particular ritual. As we heard in the scripture, this was the custom of the Jewish people in the day over a variety of things. You would wash your hands. There was a ritual, ritual cleansing of hands before you did a variety of things. It's not the ritual that Jesus objects to. It's the tip of the iceberg that represents for the other rituals, the bigger rituals that followed it like not eating with tax collectors or sinners or prostitutes or the poor, uh, and holding themselves apart as the people of God, so much so that they lost track of the things in the, inside of all of that that made their faith what it was. So a couple of things about today and why it looks this way. We're outside today, so we're already outside the norm that we've come to understand our ritual for how we understand worship in a sanctuary with an altar and a couple of candles and flowers and other kinds of things, things that mean something to us. All good, right? But outside, given the fact that we've had a pretty dry summer, I decided that lighting candles wasn't gonna be a good idea because we'd either start a fire or they blow out, so why? So from a practical point of view in the moment, that was an intentional choice. Why not flowers and other things? Well, because I had a different decor in mind, as you can see. So when you looked at this, if I had done this before you'd all come up to sit down at the very start of worship, what might you have thought? There are three decks of playing cards here. Why is pastor putting them on the altar or the equivalent thereof? Why three decks? Why are they spilling onto the floor? Isn't she concerned about the cards that are traveling with the breeze around the corner of the church? Anyone tempted to clean them up? Uh -huh. Right? Anyone disturbed that that's what's on the altar for today? Maybe not that you'll admit, but I'll bet there are. Okay. It's a forest and trees kind of situation, a bit like the Pharisees with Jesus today. They would have, if they were here, they probably would have been more than appalled that this is what they were seeing, whatever the equivalent would have been for them in the day. For me, what this represents is a lesson that I learned about this very kind of thing, okay? I, I have shared already with you that I was a chaplain for a time uh, in, in a chaplain residency working with hospice patients. And probably 95% of my patients were Alzheimer and dementia patients. So. It was a lesson in slowing down, being patient, being present to whatever was right in front of me over and over and over again and looking for different ways to communicate and different ways to see. Enter Jane, a new admission to my service on hospice, and I went to see her in a memory care facility. She was seated at a table in a wheelchair a little a little tipped over like this, hard on the neck to stay upright. I had the opportunity to talk with her family who shared with me that she was a woman of deep faith. So I, I knew that going in and that she loved to sort and organize things. So I would go in to visit her and there'd be all manner of 
magazines and newspapers and ads and things spread out in front of her, all in seeming chaos. But for her, it was somewhere that spoke to something in her that allowed her to connect in another way. And she would move papers around as though sorting and organizing. So on my third visit in, I'm not necessarily surprised to see this when I go in, right? And everything in me, like those of you who said, yes, I'd like to pick that up for you. Uh, my first notion is, oh, let me straighten out the cards for her. But that wasn't why they were there, right? And I thought, well, so let's just take a look and honor the person who's here and what's here and see what happens. So I sat, I sat, I actually didn't sit, I knelt down at her feet so that even with her head tipped, she could see me and didn't say anything except hello. And then we probably spent 15 minutes quietly moving cards. I mean, barely moving them. So I wasn't doing anything for her other than to let her know that I was present to where she was. Jesus is asking the Pharisees to be present to where they are. Her ritual was this. It didn't hurt anyone, bother anyone, and in fact, it filled her up. And in my willingness to stop where I was to see where she was, we had a beautiful 15-minute nonverbal interaction celebrating who she was in that moment. I will tell you that I've done this once before. I did it at school. A uh, course of study, uh, Occasionally, students were invited to preach at chapel. We met at chapel five days a week, and so I was invited one year, and I thought about this in a slightly different context, okay? We went to the chapel at Claremont uh, School of Theology, stunning chapel. Uh, I want to say it's maybe four stories high, and long, narrow uh, columns of stained glass between white columns just a stunning and you go in and it's set up like a standard sanctuary all the chairs facing forward beautiful hand carved wood beautiful altar and that's where we would have service except that this came to mind and i thought i <sighs> y'all can't see marcia over here laughing i'm just saying i looked at that and i thought how might we change this up a little bit so that there's some break from the norm enough that we can see something new in how we're worshiping today. So I asked a bunch of my colleagues if they would go in and help me reset the chapel floor. I think it's set probably a hundred or more. And all we needed were about 40 chairs. And I said, I want you to set them in a circle. And in that circle, I'm gonna put a low table like the kids use in Sunday school. And on that table, I'm gonna put all these cards and that's where we'll start. So right, right away, we're out of line with tradition because all the, prayer, all the chairs are in a circle and we, I asked them to set it up in such a way that it would, you would be obvious you would draw attention to yourself if you wanted to get a chair and not be in the circle. So now everyone's sitting and watching one another and I'm telling this story and I'm on the floor next to these cards. And something happened there. Something about this woman's faith and being present to where we are happened in that moment that was powerful, or so I'm told. And as people were exiting after we sang songs and did prayers and so forth there, oh, great message, great message, great message. Guess what, guess what happened next? We were due to go to lunch. I thought, we'll just come back later in the day. Nothing else is scheduled in the chapel today. We'll come back and reset later. And four professors and five students couldn't let that go. So before they went to lunch, they set everything up the way it always used to be. <laughs> right. I wonder if that's how Jesus feels when he's trying to get across messages like these that say, folks, really, if you stick right here, it's not about the washing of hands. It's about the things that are happening around us. It's about taking this a step further than you can see. It's about being willing to change or be open, even in the moment, to do something more to do something, to do things that are beyond setting ourselves apart. Of course we wash our hands. How did he know they hadn't? Was it really about that? Were there prostitutes and tax collectors and poor people sitting with them maybe? 
So that the only thing the Pharisees could see that they felt safe in was to say, you didn't do this. Because anything bigger might have been harder to do. They couldn't hang with them. They couldn't stay with them. All they could do is back up to the way they had always done things. And there was nothing wrong with it except that at some point it had moved out of the law that they had based those rituals on to something that said, this is what we do in order to show that we're people of God. What would show you that I was a person of God? Would it have been better if I put candles and flowers? Would it have made a difference if we'd done the songs differently, the prayers differently? The, what is it that makes us people of God? Certainly it's this. This is our ritual on a Sunday morning. We get together and share music and scripture and message. All good. Jesus is asking what happens after that. If all we know to do is stay away from people that we're uncomfortable with, wash our hands, and set ourselves apart as something special, then there's no God in that. He didn't win that argument then, did he? But he started it there. He was just trying to tell them and invite us to be present for what was actually there. They'd been under oppression. They developed the system for keeping themselves together, which was okay for as far as it went, but then there was no room to go anywhere else. Jesus is asking us to go somewhere else. To set aside the ritual in favor of the person. To honor the law from a place of loving and not just because it says do this. Make sense? Because then we can allow cards and chaos into our lives, knowing that as long as the ritual we follow is to be open to what's there and why, and allow God to tell us the story and the meaning, so that we know what to do from there. Isn't that the better path? To be ready for something new? To be open to what's being said beyond what we can see? to love like that and make that the law? <laughs> May it be so. Amen. Amen.